Welcome, welcome everyone. We are thrilled for all of you to be here with us for the book launch of Jonathan Kutab's new book, just released, The Truth Shall Set You Free, the story of a Palestinian human rights lawyer working for peace and justice in Palestine, Israel. Um, so again, good, good afternoon, good evening, good morning if you're coming in from <laughs> somewhere else. And uh, we're, we're thrilled for you to be with us. We are Friends of Seville North America. Jonathan, if you don't know, is the executive director of the organization. Um, what we do, Friends of Seville North America, or FOSNA, is a trans-denominational Christian organization seeking justice and peace in the Holy Land through education, advocacy, and nonviolent action. And what we do is we promote the vision of Seville Jerusalem, an ecumenical liberation theology movement founded by Palestinian Christians in the Holy Land, joining Friends of Seville chapters from around the world. As a nonprofit organization in the U.S., we amplify the voice of Palestinians by advocating in churches, communities, governments for justice, peace, and liberation in Palestine. And all of us together, uh, we are a Christian voice for Palestine. Uh, so I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please note that the session is being recorded. So plan accordingly. So in case uh, you don't want, we want to be very sensitive to people. So you can hide your camera, change your name in the, in the little box up in the corner, um, plan accordingly for that. We are being recorded. There will be a time for question and answer towards the end. And for that, we will be utilizing the chat function. So at any time uh, you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will uh, have a time specifically for uh, Q&A as we get move towards the end. And in our chats and in our back and forths, uh, we just ask, follow the golden rule and everything do to others as you would have them do to, to do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. It is good for Zoom chat boxes as much as international relations. So we are here for the book launch of The Truth Shall Set You Free. And I wanted to start with an endorsement from Jim Wallace of Sojourners about Jonathan's book. Jesus says the peacemakers will be called the children of God not just the many peace lovers, which is easy, but to fight for peace the way soldiers fight for war is much harder. Jonathan Kutab is genuinely and courageously a warrior for peace in one of the most complicated and seemingly impossible conflicts on our planet. The biblical call to bring darkness into light entails telling the truth that Jesus says can only set us free. That is what Jonathan does, and this is his marvelous story. So without much further ado, I hand the floor, the video over to Jonathan. Thank you, thank you very much, Jesse, uh, for those kind words. Uh, before I do a reading from the book, uh, I'd like to just uh, mention uh, something about the nature of the book. Uh, th this book uh, started out as a collection of vignettes and stories uh, uh, about, my, about, my... about my own uh, life, my own uh, faith journey, my own uh, struggle with issues of peace and war and violence and nonviolence my work in human rights, uh, and how my faith interacted with all these issues. Uh, uh, so uh, it is actually uh, a story or a collection of stories. And uh, while I hope it is very entertaining and interesting to read, I think it is also uh, informative because I try to explain the nature of the situation uh, back home 
and and for the, and and tell the story, my own story, but also the story of others who are struggling for justice and who are trying to find a different way of uh, dealing with the injustices there, uh, rather than just uh, violence and hatred and a zero sum uh, situation. Uh, so uh, I would. Uh, like to commend the book to you and if you uh, read it and like it to consider sharing it with others and maybe uh, write a few uh, comments it's available in uh, Barnes and Nobles uh, in paperback as well as in Kindle as an ebook and I hope it will be uh, also available eventually as an audiobook uh, so I'm going to do that so I will start by reading a uh, portion uh, of it around page 215, where I talk about some of the work that I do as a lawyer after I open my office. And uh, I mentioned Mubarak Awad, who is with us today, and hopefully we will engage with him. And so I say one day, Mubarak dropped by my office. Why do you think the settlers are always uprooting Palestinian olive trees? Is it to deprive them of their livelihood and force them to leave the land? Land that has olive trees not only provides a family with food and income for generations, but it is also living physical proof of continued agricultural use. An olive tree requires several years of careful tending before it begins to yield its fruit. I thought for a minute and replied, you remember the story we were taught in school about a king who once saw an old man planting an olive seedling? He asked the farmer if he expected to live long enough to enjoy the fruits of his labor. And the old man replied, they planted and we eat and we ate. Now we plant so that they can eat. The obvious lesson was that he planted for the benefit of his children and grandchildren, just as he had benefited from the work of his parents and grandparents. Some olive trees are so old, they are referred to as Rumi, meaning from the times of the Romans. The olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem are reputed to be from the time of Christ. The existence of cultivated olive trees all over Palestine is a testament to the continued use of the land by the people who lived on it for centuries. So switching from my professional mode, which Mubarak had tolerated with mild amusement, I told him, legally speaking, it's even trickier than that. So my poor cousin had to endure another lengthy lecture. Israel has decided to revive an old Ottoman law which says that land outside city boundaries that is not used for agriculture for 10 continuous years can revert to the emir. Land that is used for vegetables or wheat production is sometimes allowed to rest for one year out of every seven. It might lie, also lie fallow when there is a drought or if there's an illness in the family or some other personal reason. Regardless of the reasons why any land might be lying fallow, it is very vulnerable under this Israeli interpretation of the Ottoman law. Aerial photographs could be introduced as evidence that the land was not used in a particular year and the farmer would lose it. But if he has olive trees growing on it, it is clearly being used continuously. Wonderful, said Mubarak. Let's start a campaign of nonviolent resistance by urging Palestinians to plant more olive trees, particularly in lands near the settlements or where settlers or soldiers have uprooted trees. I can get the Mennonites or Quakers to donate money for hundreds of olive seedlings, which we can offer to villagers and help them plant them in areas facing confiscation. I thought it was a wonderful idea. So Mubarak started get, get going from village to village, telling people that they could protect their land from confiscation by planting trees on it. 
He told them that he would organize group of foreigners, Israeli peace activists and others to join them as they planted olive saplings on their lands. There were only two conditions. First, that they would not throw stones at the soldiers. It was important that they actively be totally nonviolent. The second was that they would not run away when the soldiers came. Nonviolence is not an option for cowards, he said. It requires as much, if not more courage than armed struggle. I accompanied Mubarak on many of these trips, which were also fascinating examples of joint Arab-Jewish cooperation for peace and justice. I would explain the legal aspects of what we were doing to the farmers and be there as a legal witness when the army or settlers would try to stop the activity. There was much debate in the Palestinian society about whether throwing stones at heavily armed soldiers, which routinely happened during political demonstration, is actually violence. But Mubarak insisted that even the appearance of, non of violence should be avoided during the activity he was organizing. If the army comes while you are planting trees, drop the hose or pick pickaxes from your hands. You do not want to give soldiers an excuse to use violence against you if you throw stones. He said, the soldiers can claim that they are afraid of your weapons. Nonviolence requires you to understand how the soldiers think and to realize that many of them, however incredible that sounds, are actually afraid of you. One day, we got a call from villagers in Khrab al Lahem near Qatanna, a West Bank village. They said that the army was cutting down and uprooting hundreds of old Rumi olive trees from their lands, which were in no man's land and on the West Bank side of the old 1967 border. Mubarak and I organized a group of foreigners and Israeli peace activists to go to the village. Sure enough, it was a scene of devastation. Israeli bulldozers and heavy equipment had been hard at work for several days, cutting off the olive branches and then uprooting the remaining trunks of the trees. The villagers were devastated. Some of the older ones were in tears, mourning over the trees like their own children. We had brought a pickup truck full of olive saplings. So we immediately got busy digging holes about 10 feet apart and then planting and watering the seedlings while the villagers prepared a meal for everyone. Soon, two jeeps filled with Israelis showed up. One was from the army and the other from the Nature Preservation Authority. They told us that the land in question was state land. Since it was near the old border between Israel and the West Bank, it no longer belonged to the villagers as the Jordanian army had taken it previously and used it. Furthermore, they stated Israel had declared the land to be a national park preserve and we were not allowed to be there at all. I stepped up and challenged their statements. This land belonged to these villagers and they have the documents to prove it. As a lawyer, I personally inspected and found their documents to be authentic. Furthermore, if you are so concerned about nature and nature preservations, why are you allowing them to cut down the fruitful trees? They had no answer. They said again that the land was now government property and we were trespassing to even be there. We all knew that this was just another method commonly used to take land from Palestinians. It was all an excuse, but they would fight very hard to maintain the fiction. It was important to them that the outside world and even Israeli society itself should project an image of democracy, liberalism, and the rule of law. One of the officers from the Nature Preservation Authority was particularly aggressive and was going around pulling out all the saplings which the volunteers were planting. Mubarak ordered that each tree should be protected by three people, a Palestinian, an Israeli Jew, and an international expat. The soldiers and so-called nature preservation personnel 
so that they were outnumbered. Though they were armed, they could not deal with people who were refusing to obey their commands. Eventually, we agreed to leave based on their promise to leave the seedlings unharmed. After they left, we celebrated and enjoyed a meal with the villagers, many of whom had never broken bread or shared a meal with Israeli Jews before. It was a beautiful moment. Sadly, we learned that the Nature Preservation Authority Jeeps came back after two days with heavy army reinforcements and pulled out all the saplings that we had planted. But the story did not end there. It came to our attention that about 20 of the uprooted olive trees had been replanted in West Jerusalem at a small park that was dedicated to the memory of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Irony of ironies. In the hallway. I have been asked. We were outraged at the hypocrisy and decided to hold a demonstration at the site of the new park. We tied yellow ribbons on the branches of the replanted trees and put up signs saying, take me back home. We tried to get some newspapers to cover the event. We also took pictures and sent a lengthy letter to Coretta Scott King, the widow of the late Martin, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., explaining the situation. We told her that if her late husband was alive, he would probably be demonstrating with us rather than accepting accolades from our oppressors. I explained that the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence, I was inspired by the example of Dr. King and that we hoped that they would send a letter from the King Center in Atlanta, explaining to the Israelis and to the Jerusalem municipality that their actions in uprooting the olive trees was a desecration of the memory of her husband and everything he stood for. Weeks passed and we heard nothing. We did not receive an acknowledgement of the letter, no reply whatsoever. One person opined that maybe the King Center in Atlanta could not afford to alienate some of its Zionist donors and funders and would rather not deal with the problems this issue presented for them. I found that hard to believe and said they probably never got the letter. In the end, <laughs> I looked up the telephone number of the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta and called them. I told the receptionist that I was calling from the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence in Jerusalem and would love to speak to Mrs. King. The receptionist said in a heavy Southern accent, is this about the trees? They had clearly received the letter. Unfortunately, Mrs. King could not be reached and nobody else was available to discuss the issue with me. They promised that she would call back, but she never did. Two years later, after Mubarak was deported, he visited Mrs. King in Atlanta. The visit resulted in a one paragraph letter from Coretta King, quote, thanking the villagers of Katanna for donating trees to be planted in memory of her late husband. We were very disappointed. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I believe Mubarak Awad wants to respond to that story. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not only I want to respond to the story, I want to thank everybody who's uh, watching and uh, who read the book or will be reading the book. It's so important for Palestinians. And uh, it's something that it's written in a way for ordinary people who also could find hope in some way, some small distance that there is a light with all the occupation, the military destruction of homes and 
everything that Palestinian goes through. And uh, the, the trees is one of many, many uh, different projects that we have. But the olive tree is important for the Palestinians because they live with the olive oil, with the making zaytun as olives. And uh, it's so sad that uh, Israel as a state, as people can destroy it without fear of anybody telling them you are doing wrong. And that's where many of the Israeli felt if nobody tells them they are doing wrong, that means everybody telling them they are the right thing. I want to say something about Jonathan in a few words here. Hopefully somebody could stop me if I go too long. Uh, uh, as a human rights lawyer, Jonathan was able to change his lifestyle by himself, leaving New York as an attorney in Wall Street, making a lot of money, decided that he will go and help Palestinian. And uh, this idea also came from his father, George Kutab, that is father. He tells story from the Bible all the time to his children. And anybody want to hear anything about the Bible, uh, Jonathan's father will tell story. It's so much of a tradition that uh, all his brothers and sister from Sam and the Hood and Lydia and Grace and Phoebe and Danny, they all tell stories, that's how they communicate. And it's a very lovely communication that we have to learn to do that. And uh, his wife, Beth, have a very nice job with the UN and took so much of her time with the UN that gave him so much time to be free to do a lot of work and human rights. Uh, Jonathan is not easy to deal with. He came with a specific idea and carried on his shoulder that law, international law, local law is so important and we have to abide by laws. We are a society of laws. And I don't, I, that's him. I don't believe in anything what he says about the law because I don't believe in the law that's written by Israelis or laws that the Knesset make because they make laws for the Israelis, not for us. They make it all against us. But he felt strongly and believing that the international law is important. It is that part of Jonathan that took a lot of people who are very ordinary people with problems and he walked with them with the law and tried to get their rights and justice through the law. That is in the courts and some people take their land, he still will feel that way even hundreds of times that the court in Israel would not satisfy Jonathan one time that he win a case. But he continued believing in the law. And this book shows the idea of Jonathan in a very dedicated to the human rights and law. And he still believe in it, and I congratulate him on that ability of thinking of that. Jonathan also is a cousin of mine, and but 
his office and my office were near each other. We will do all the activities together. And uh, I, been, I start seeing him more and seeing my brother Alex or Bishara or my sister Ellen. So we became very close to the point that I know what he's thinking and he know what I'm thinking. Before we say a word, he said, don't do that. Don't do that and uh, on that. However, also he believed in the humanity of the Israelis. As a Palestinian believing in the humanity of the Israelis, that we as Palestinian and Israel are human being, okay? And we should not have hate and anger divide us that much. And through that concept, he wrote so much and trying even to get Israelis on his side for a case of land or for a case of a house demolition or for a case when the Israelis uh, sealed homes of thousands of Palestinian prisoners to, and so that we will open them. He said that they, we can find one Israeli or somebody could say, when the Israelis release the prisoners, they will tell us to open their homes or they will come and open the homes that they sealed. They didn't. So we did it ourselves. And all, all those activities is to show that he still was able to do it. He based his thinking on three things. One is his upbringing as a Christian. And he has influence by the Mennonites and Quakers, which they don't go to war and help others as much as possible. The second that he never did something for money to get rich. And that, that's an important thing for him. He took cases after cases after cases without being paid. And even the Israeli government started giving him cases that nobody will take just so that he will represent them in the court. And the last one, he took my case. And having taken my case, he is courageous enough to deal with me. And that became, we became not only friends, but we became very acquainted with each other. He also have people who work with him and admire his work. And I just mentioned few, it's like Robin Wainwright, Okay, and Jim Ryan, uh, which we started Operation Smile, and uh, other people uh, from World Vision, Tom Getman, and also the people in the embassy, the church people, uh, the Muslim groups, and everybody. He was able to cross things. And the last thing, he refused completely to join any party. And the Israeli couldn't get him on things because he's not affiliated with any party there. And uh, having refused to join any party, uh, forced the uh, Palestinian Authority that he lost the election when he won the election. And uh, then he doesn't only criticize the Israeli way of treating Palestinian, but also he criticizes Palestinian when Palestinian treat Palestinians. And that became a very tough thing. And even when, and you could read that in his book, when he was asked to help in the negotiation with the Israelis, he felt it's a game that they are playing. Everything was already set 
and they try to have him as a person who is part of the negotiations. So he was telling the Palestinians that's not the right way. We have to have the best expert in negotiation. We have to have professors. We have to have people in those fields for negotiation when we negotiate with the Israeli, not just do it by our hips. And so his book, I recommend it, but I recommend it not only to the speaking people who speak English, I want him to have that book in Arabic so that every Palestinian can read that book and his story so that other Palestinians could write their stories. And we need that message to be part of our uh, way to tell the whole world this is our story. And thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, very kind words, but you also are uh, reminding me of many of the stories and many of the people in the book, uh, because there certainly were a lot of people who were, uh, especially during the first Intifada, who were carrying out some very interesting, some very creative, some very courageous uh, activities uh, to, to, to resist the occupation without necessarily using violence or guns or bombs or knives. Yeah. I want to add one thing that my wife, Nancy and I, uh, thank you so much because you have been working so hard when I was in prison, not only the first time or the 10th time or the 30th time, but at least she could call you and you, you said, you know where I am at. I appreciate that. You, uh, it's it's interesting uh, the synchronizing our activities together. I was the lawyer, and you were the activist out there uh, doing the actual civil disobedience work. I remember one time I uh, told you, "Look, I need to be out there doing things." And you said, no, 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 no. You stand on the side so that you can help us. Once we get in jail, you can take us out. We don't need one more person to be in jail. We need one more person outside to help us uh, come out. So yes, uh, we, we had a very good uh, cooperation, very good relationship. Uh, one of uh, the stories I tell in the book is, is how Al-Haq was created, the human rights organization, uh, the first Palestinian human rights organization with myself, Raja Shahadi and Charles Shammas and others, uh, how we felt it was very important to accurately fine. collect and document the human rights violation and present them to the Israelis as well as to the outside world in a very compelling uh, way. Uh, in a way, this is what is meant by the truth shall set you free. And we felt it was very important, truth, justice, and peace. And in that order, you can't have peace without justice. And you can't obtain justice without first knowing the truth and speaking the truth to those who are in power uh, as as you go. I, to end that, I have to tell them a story, which is a very small story about a fellow in prison. He was wearing a hat. Oh, the three hats. <laughs> and the guard in prison, he said, take your hat off. And the man refused. So they put them in the hole. And after one month or two months, they get him out. And when he's out, he put another hat, he put two hats. The Israeli police, Israeli guard told him, take the two hats off. He said, no. Then they put him in the hole. After a while, when they get him out of the hole, he put three hats and then the Israeli said, let it go. And that's 
shows the commitment of the Palestinians with all the difficulties, they are willing, willing to sacrifice everything and steadfastness is part of life there. And in Jonathan writing about those people whom he met in prison, who, who met in land confiscation is a commitment of those Palestinians to steadfastness in their life. Thank you all for hearing us. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, I have a couple questions, then we will open it up uh, to others. Um, first question, you do you write a lot about your personal faith journey in your book. Um, how does your faith, your your Christianity, particularly as what might you might describe a red letter Christian uh, influence your views on Israel and Palestine um, and the struggle? Yeah, I, I used to be very sensitive to this type of question uh, because I, I thought whoever was asking the question was trying to make a distinction between Muslims and Christians and split the community. So you have, you hold all these views because of your Christian upbringing, but the majority of Palestinians are not Christian at all. They are Muslim. Uh, but, but, but as I grew up and I think matured more, uh, I realized that while both Christians and Muslims are under the same uh, oppressive occupation, uh, for me personally, my faith was definitely part of uh, the way I responded to that oppression. And yes, like other Christians and like other evangelicals, I had my uh, period of agnosticism, questioning, uh, wondering about the truth of my faith, uh, and uh, wondering whether Jesus' words really are meaningful today for us, for Palestinians in our situation, uh, but but my conclusion was 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 that it is. In fact, my conclusion uh, is that nonviolence is the best, the best strategy and policy for Palestinians to follow, and it is good news also for Jewish Israelis to 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 seek alternatives to violence. That, that if you want to live in this land, you don't need more weapons. You don't need more violence. You don't need overwhelming military might. You need understanding and you need cooperation uh, and you need, sometimes you need to make concessions, yeah, but you need to walk the path of peace that that is not only better, but also more effective in the long run to achieve your goals rather than simply hating and killing uh, your, your enemies and your opponents. So uh, the, the book ends with a, uh, a sort of uh, realization that we need a new vision for Palestine, Israel, uh, a vision that is not based on power, that is not based on tribalism, that is not based on apartheid and separateness, but, but a new state that encompasses everybody together in one state. I, I, I wrote a, uh, a book before this one called Beyond the Two-State Solution. And in fact, anybody who buys the book can download uh, the previous book for free uh, from Nonviolence International. Uh, it's called Beyond the Two-State Solution. Uh, and uh, it, it provides a vision for a society that encompasses Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, both Christians and Muslims, in a single unitary state. Thank you, Jonathan. That actually uh, partly answers uh, one of the first questions we have from the chat, which was, what do you see as an answer to resolving this conflict? Um, 
And what, but so the second part of that question is what agreement can be made and how do we help bring this to fruition? Well, uh, you know, in, in my book, Beyond the Two State Solution, I do provide that, that vision and I do enumerate a number of steps along the way towards that vision, working towards that vision uh, to create more justice, more equality, uh, more human rights, uh, more uh, cooperation rather than apartheid and discrimination and, and uh, hatred. Uh, but, but I was told when I wrote that book, I was told people don't want to read political tracts. They don't want to read good analysis. They want to hear a story. They want to hear your story. And this was, by the way, what led me to write this book, uh, The Truth Shall Set You Free. Because people, I think, can be touched uh, in their hearts before they can uh, follow with their minds uh, and conscience to do the right thing. So this book is a story or a collection of stories. And, and I hope through it, we can move towards a better place. Thank you. Um, the next question that came through is from someone who says, we write letters to our Congress people all the time. What message do you think can help get through to the decision makers? Well, it is important uh, to, to get through to our uh, decision makers, but it's not only important to convince them. It is more important to compel them to do the right thing. Uh, because many of our representatives in, in the United States, I'm, I'm talking now, uh, may not know the facts, may not be convinced, but more than likely, even if they knew the facts, they need to be told in a compelling way that you need to do X, Y, or Z, otherwise you will not be elected because they need to see the power of those who believe in justice and in peace, and not only the power of those who can write a check and give a huge contribution, and demand that they act uh, in, uh, for the special interests. We have a problem in the United States. Money is playing too large a part in our politics. And special interests are too powerful in determining policies in, in many spheres, not just in the issue of uh, Palestine-Israel. Uh, so we have a problem in the United States to, to get a really genuinely representative uh, democracy. And, uh, but uh, ultimately, people will vote and politicians will see who is voting. Uh, so you can write many letters, but if you don't show up on, on, uh, on election day, if you don't organize enough people to show up on elections day in favor of uh, the policies that you believe in, you will not have much uh, power and influence uh, in, in politics. Seem, uh, this is Mubarak again. Uh, there, there is always hope. You know, if you look at South Africa, South Africa with apartheid, nobody believed that there would be change there. Look at Northern Ireland, nobody believed the fighting between the two groups, the Catholic and Protestants will end. And uh, nobody believed that in the United States for a while that blacks can be free and they are not slave anymore, or the Native Americans would really have justice here. And it's, it's, it's a time element that, and we as Palestinian, we have this hope that one day, somehow, that the Israelis, instead of putting their effort and money in destruction of the Palestinian culture and society, okay, that they could do it in bringing the Palestinian economic better 
and the education better, the health better of the Palestinian. And that will be a different way of saying that we are equal with you and let's make it now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question that has come in is, why is it that so many people around the world um, are ignorant of the way Israel treats Palestinians and what and how do we change that? What can we do and how, um, how can we change that? Well, I, I, I wrestle uh, with that question in my book uh, because I say uh, part of the problem is us Palestinians. If we do not tell our story in a convincing and compelling way, uh, we think it is self-evident, uh, but, but things are not always self-evident, uh, especially if you have organized powerful forces working against you who control the narrative, who control the speech. I mean, everybody in the United States knows how many rockets were shot from Gaza on Israel. Nobody knows how many bombs came from Israel to Gaza. Uh, so those who control the narrative uh, can 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 be very convincing, uh, and we as Palestinians, not just Palestinians, uh, we as people who work for peace and justice, need to recapture the narrative. And I don't mean by that that we should promote a Palestinian narrative at the expense of a, an Israeli narrative, but but a narrative that really believes in justice that believes in equality, that believes in fairness, that believes in human dignity. Uh, this is why, for example, the issue of apartheid becomes very important. Uh, Israel doesn't want to use the word ap apartheid. They'll tell you if you use the word apartheid, you're being anti-Semitic. Uh, but apartheid is a legal term that is defined in international law. It has three elements. When you have a system, that allows one group to dominate others and that that domination is written into the laws and the regulation and that that, that domination uses collective punishment, torture, uh, imprisonment, deportations, etc. Then you have the three elements of apartheid and you don't have to compare yourself to South Africa because in many ways our situation is worse than South Africa. But the crime of apartheid today is an international crime. So we have an obligation to inform the rest of the world about the truth, the reality of the situation, and then demand, but also work to see that justice is done and that that apartheid regime is dismantled because that is what is required in order to achieve genuine democracy and equality. Thank you. Um, there are a few other good questions coming in, but our time is running short. Um, can you quickly tell me, it's a question I have, what was your decision behind self-publishing? <laughs> Uh, when I wrote the book, I thought that my job was finished. I wrote the book. Then I was told you have to find a publisher and the most publishers won't even talk to you uh, unless you have a literary agent. So you have to find a literary agent uh, who meets the particular criteria or niche or market that you believe in. And so I started and you have to write an abstract and you have to convince uh, uh, the proper uh, literary agent. I found myself, I was spending more time on trying to find an agent and find a publisher. And then somebody told me that, you know, these days the publishing houses don't really do much for you. In this day and age, they're expecting you to do the marketing you to do the, the, the distribution. As so I said, well, why do I need a publisher for? You can self-publish. In fact, this book is published by what's called the Hakawati publishing firm. Hakawati is a storyteller in Arabic. 
So the publisher is myself, Hakawati, the storyteller, and you are my literary agent. Read the book. If you like it, if you think it has something that's worth telling, then, you know, put a little blip in the, on Barnes and Nobles, they have a place where you write reviews, even if it's a few sentences uh, for the book, or if you can publish in your local or national paper or magazine a proper uh, essay, a book review of it, you are my publisher. And that's, that's how the book uh, gets <laughs> distributed. Thank you, Jonathan. Maybe others didn't have that same question, but I, I did. <laughs> So at this point, um, I'm going to ask if Mubarak and then you, Jonathan, have any final words before we, we close it out that you want to share. Um, maybe start with Mubarak and then, then Jonathan. Yeah, I am happy as uh, the president of Nonviolence International that this organization also started with Jonathan Kutab and we are uh, having a lot of people around the world and adding to a fellow by the name of Gene Sharp, many methods and theories of nonviolence and trying to spread the word of nonviolence. And we are seeing progress in nonviolence, not only in Palestine, but in other parts of the world. And we are, with that give us a lot of hope in a future uh, where only we hear about guns and killing each other and destruction. But uh, also we have to show people that nonviolence is doing well around the world. Yeah, yes, definitely. I would like to end up with that uh, positive message that Mubarak just uh, uh, articulated. Uh, and, and, and yes, I speak as a Christian and the gospel is supposed to be good news. And we don't hear good news uh, in the Middle East very often. Even those Christians who talk about Armageddon and the end of the world, that's not good news. <laughs> not, not for Palestinians, not for the whole world, and not for Jews either. Uh, if your theology uh, demands that they all either convert or be destroyed in the end days. The good news is that God loves us both, Jews and Arabs, Palestinians, Muslims. God loves us. And he has given us, shown us a new path forward that is not based on power and domination and control, but on love and companionship and brotherhood and peace, which is based on justice. Uh, I, I think that that's a positive message that we should carry out as followers of Jesus. Uh, I think we need to do that. And thanks to all of you for coming to this event. Thank you, Jonathan. Remind us how people can get the book again. Uh, get online or go to your local Barnes and Nobles and ask them why they're not carrying it. Uh, you can order it through them uh, or through your local book uh, store or online. Uh, it's available in Barnes and Nobles, also on Amazon uh, and other places. But I really. I uh, think it's it's a message that, that needs to go out, and I'm pleased if people hear it and read it. And if people want to hear you every week reflect on topics <laughs> and news of the day, what can they do and where can they go? <laughs> they can join the FOSNA. Uh, they can send their email to FOSNA, F-O-S-N-A dot org. Uh, every week, uh, most weeks I write a reflection on current affairs, what's going on uh, these days. And uh, some people find that useful as well. Uh, Fosna.org, it's, uh, it's an organization here in the US that carries out the mission of uh, Sabil in Jerusalem of Palestinian liberation theology and endeavors to be a Christian voice for Palestine. But of course, others can also join uh, and its activities working for justice. Yes, it's also found in Walmart. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. sorry. Jonathan Mubarak. Uh, special shout out to Randy and Layla for helping on the back end. And thank you, everyone. Have a lovely, lovely evening. And thanks for limiting it to one hour. We're all zoomed out. <laughs>